Um, I'm Terry DeVoe with the Grants to States program, and we welcome you to this orientation, which is kind of a precursor to tomorrow and Wednesday's conference. Um, we are prompting folks to add their state initials to their name in Zoom. And we have a travel theme for this conference because we're all just thinking about travel and wishing we could travel with you. Um, so we're gonna travel in our minds. <laughs> and the, the icebreaker that we had prompted folks to answer in the chat was the last trip you took before the pandemic. We got some great responses so far. Lori Fisher in New Hampshire had taken um, a trip to DC to see Garth Brooks at the Library of Congress, very exciting. Uh, Mandy in Illinois had gone to Asheville, North Carolina. Stacy in Arizona thought she'd gone to San Diego. Uh, Madison from our team had gone to New York City. Jody Thomas to New Zealand, wow. Uh, Laura McKenzie had gone to Nashville. A few other folks had gone to PLA in Nashville uh, right before the pandemic. Dennis was in Alabama for a state library site visit and on and on. Susan Forbes, Walt Disney World, so cool. Tucson, Myrtle Beach, Morocco. So the, the chat is pouring in now and we welcome you to continue it. Um, so just a few things. We are going to be recording these sessions and we will eventually post them on our website. It usually takes us a little bit to prepare. Um, so just bear with us. They won't be immediately available, but we'll get them to you. And um, yes, this is an orientation for newer folks to the program. Maybe you've been with us a year or not even a year, or you just want a refresher and we welcome you all. Um, so a quick hour precursor to the general conference. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is introduce our team. Uh, you will probably see our faces throughout the conference, but just in case you forgot what we looked like, uh, we've got all of us here on the slide. Dennis Nangle, our senior program officer, Madison Bowles, another senior program officer, myself, uh, Terry DeVoe, our associate deputy director, Laura McKenzie, our newest team member and program specialist, and Michelle Farrell, our program officer. Um, so we are a small and mighty team, and we've got a great uh, orientation planned for you. So I am going to kick it over to Laura McKenzie to get us started. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I wanted to start with some acronyms and vocabulary that are a part of the program. Uh, so starting with uh, the Museum and Library Services Act, or MLSA, uh, that's the broader IMLS statute that encompasses LSTA, also known as the Library Services and Technology Act. And the LSTA, as currently amended, is a subchapter of the authorizing legislation for IMLS. In 1996, Congress shifted the Library Services and Construction Act, LSCA, to the Library Services and Technology Act, LSTA, as subchapter two of the Museum and Library Services Act. This ended federal funding for library construction and replaced it with a focus on new information technologies. LSTA encompasses IMLS discretionary programs and it implemented a population-based formula. We have the CARES Act that was passed on March 27th, uh, 2020, an economic stimulus to assist American workers, families, and small businesses during the pandemic. As a lot of you know, IMLS received $50 million to focus on digital inclusion and or technical capacity building. For example, PPE purchases to assist libraries and museums. ARPA is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, and this is a one-time funding supporting museum and library services. The Grants to States program, which we sometimes refer to as G2S, is the largest source of federal funding support for library services in the US. State library administrative agencies, or SLAAs, are official agencies charged by law with the extension and development of library services. 
The LSTA regulations require each SLAA to submit a five-year plan that details library services goals. SLAAs must also conduct a five-year evaluation of service goals based on that plan. ACO is the authorized certifying official for the grant award. Uh, in most cases, this will be the state librarian, uh, but it could also be the administrator that the state librarian reports to. And finally, the chief officers of state library agencies, or COSLA. Yeah, this is an independent organization representing state and territorial agencies designated as the SLAA. COSLA serves as a mechanism to help address challenges faced by the heads of the state agencies, which are responsible for statewide library development. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2019, IMLS switched our grants management system to EGMS. You will learn more about EGMS and the reach messaging feature a bit later in this presentation. SAM.gov is the official system for award management website of the US government. This site allows grantees no cost access to register and to do business with the US government including updating or renewing your entity registration, among other tasks. Each grantee must include their DUNS number, TIN number, and bank routing number and keep their registration current to receive grant funds. The state library needs to be sure that their subrecipients have put their information into this system and that it is current. Uh, next up is the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, or FIFADA. This was signed in 2006 to reduce wasteful spending and increase public transparency of fi federal financial assistance and expenditures. The FIFADA Subaward Reporting System, or FSRS, is the reporting tool that prime recipients, in this case, the SLAAs, enter information on subrecipients who've received grants of $30,000 or more. The State Program Report, or SPR, is part of an online system that is specific to the Grants to States reporting requirements for grant awards. And you can access the SPR login page at imls.gov. A match is the amount of money, specifically 34% of the grant allotment that our LSTA legislation requires from the state library to contribute toward the grant program each year. These funds are from non-federal resources, including state, local, corporate, foundation, or other non-federal entities. The SPR will automatically populate the expected grant match amount. And lastly, uh, MOE, or Maintenance of Effort, uh, the Library Services and Technology Act helps ensure that federal dollars enhance and do not replace state support for library services. To receive the full amount allowed by the LSTA grants to states formula, a state must maintain its financial support for library programs and services at not less than the average amount reported for the prior three fiscal years. If a state does not meet its MOE level in any given reporting year, its next allotment is reduced by the same percentage as the missed MOE. The law provides an opportunity for states to request a waiver of MOE under specific circumstances. Please refer to the Grants to States section online at imls.gov or reach out to your program officer for more information. Next slide, please. And now here we have a few words that might be found on your grant award document. The federal government requires a business, in this case, the SLAA, to have at least one of these numbers. While IMLS does not assign any of the first three numbers, IMLS does, however, assign the Federal Award Identification Number, or FAIN, 
and the federal government will stop using the DUNS number to uniquely identify entities registered in the System for Award Management, SAM, by April of 2022. At that point, entities doing business with the federal government will use a unique entity identifier, UEI or UE, created in SAM.gov. You should already be an active registrant in SAM.gov. And the GSA, another acronym here, General Service Administration, will assign a UE to you and it will be viewable within SAM.gov. There is no action for registered entities to take at this time. And the next slide, please. And here we have a few more acronyms. Uh, PTE, uh, pass-through entity, is a non-federal entity that provides a subaward to a subrecipient to carry out part of a federal program. For example, the state library is a PTE. And the IDC indirect costs are those costs not readily identified with a specific project or organizational activity, but incurred for the joint benefit of both projects and other activities. Indirect costs are usually grouped into common pools and charged to benefiting objectives through an allocation process. An indirect cost rate is simply a device for determining fairly and expeditiously the proportion of general or non-direct expenses that each project will bear. It is the ratio between the total indirect costs of an applicant and some equitable direct cost base. Indirect costs include costs which are frequently referred to as overhead expenses, such as rent and utilities and general administrative expenses. For example, officers' salaries, accounting department costs, and personnel and department costs. And with that, I will turn it over to Madison. Thanks so much, Laura. We'll go on to the next slide. Great, welcome everybody. So happy to have you here. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about communications. Uh, once IMLS receives notification from the State Library that a new LSTA coordinator has started, we will send a welcome message letting that person know who their program officer is and where to find program information. Uh, your program officer will also send a message regarding who your mentor is as part of the mentors program. The mentors are drawn from a voluntary group of experienced coordinators, so you will have two experienced people to draw from when you have questions about the program. Your program officer is going to be the person to contact for the official interpretation of program legislative requirements. You will also be added to the state program report system and the EGMS grants management system and login and use instructions will be sent to you. Next slide. Between email and the EGMS system, you will have a few ways to communicate with your program officer. Email is going to be the more common and informal way, and here are a few reasons to use email in your communication. These can be allowable cost questions, contact changes, SPR issues, or just general feedback that you have for your program officer. You'll also want to send your quarterly grant accrual reports through email, but that will go to the email address, address that is listed on this slide. Uh, this is actually a pretty good slide to keep for your records just in case you need to refer back to it. Next slide, please. As mentioned, our EGMS REACH system, Electronic Grants Management System, is used by IMLS awardees to manage their awards. And only official contacts like the chief officer or authorized, uh, authorized certifying official, LSTA coordinator, or the designated uh, library development or finance officer have access to this system in order to administrate, administer your award. Uh, through EGMS Reach, you can request payments, see past payments, and see reporting schedules. You'll also be able to send official messages directly to your program officer responsible for administering your award. Next slide, please. Now with this messaging in EGMS Reach, you will want to communicate things that should be part of the official grant record, so, so more formal communications. 
Uh, this is a good slide again to, to keep for your records uh, to refer back to. Uh, for example, uh, messaging, um, messaging and reach is good for SPR extension requests, uh, sending newly signed certifications and assurances, and MOE waiver requests. Um, I, I, IMLS has a great deal of information available to you on our website um, about communications, um, but if you have any doubt about how to send what message, uh, you can ask your program officer Program officer, the best way to do it. With that, I'm gonna send it over to Michelle. Hi, everyone. I think you've heard a lot about the vocabulary and such. I wanna talk about the IMLS website. If you go to the IMLS website at www.imls.gov, that will take you, uh, it'll have a number of tabs up at the top. You want to go to grants, and then from there, pick grant programs, and then select grants to states. When you've done those three clicks, you get to this page. And this is the page that has the grants to states manual. You're probably gonna wanna bookmark it. There are sections in this grants manual on the award cycle calendar, financial requirements, financial and performance reporting, the SPR, site visits, IMLS guidance, statutes and regulations, any of the presentations that we give at conferences or if we do a separate webinar, any forms that we use that we feel you would need to have access to, and our contact information. And as you can see on this slide, there's history, five-year plan evaluation tabs, and the state allotment table. Next. This slide is showing you three webinars that are available in the Grants to States Manual under the Financial and Performance Reporting tab. The first webinar, which we have given in the past, is called the SPR Overview and Guide. This particular webinar gives you detailed information on concepts, adding projects, intents, subjects, activities, all the aspects of the SPR report. And there are hyperlinks to those particular topics within the uh, webinar. I think you'll find it useful. The second one is the IMLS state program reporting requirements. This gives you uh, a description of the SPR framework and basically what is composed of the SPR, what they call data elements. And the last webinar is the SPR reporting system user documentation, what the state library sees. So there's some glossary terms there and screenshots, which you'll find useful. Next. This is the login address for the SPR system. IMLS, your IMLS program officer can set you up in the SPR system by creating an account for you. Your username is your email address and we will send you your password. You can change your password by going into the account management section of the SPR after you're logged in. Please note that Chrome and Foxfire are the recommended browsers for using the SPR system. Issues with saving and editing can occur also if you have open two browser windows or tabs at the same time in the SPR. So it's best to avoid that. Next. And here's where you'll find the state info page under the account management tab. So you can see up at the left account management and then it says state info. This is an important page. Having up-to-date contact information in the SPR is important. You will need it to certify your report. IMLS also uses the contacts listed here when sending important communications. This page includes the agency information, as you see at the top, the chief officer, the LSTA coordinator contact, head of library development, and the fiscal officer. 
please note that only you can update this page. Once you have updated this account management state info section, then you might want to send an email to your program officer so you can let us know that you've added a new contact person. And we've had a lot of that this year. The DUNS in EIN are not required to save the data, but they are required to certify the report. So you'll want to put that in, the, in that section there in the top. Also note the parent organization should match the name associated with your DUNS number. Next. There are three fiscal officers you can list in the state info section of the SPR. The main fiscal officer is listed first. If you have other fiscal staff that you would like to have access to EGMS, you can list them as fiscal officer one and two. If you have even more fiscal staff that need access to EGMS for drawdown processes, then email your program officer with the contact information for those persons. SPR just has room for three. Next. Here you'll see our table of user, user roles. There are four user roles in the SPR reporting system. The LSTA coordinator and the authorized certifying official, ACO, accounts have permission to manage subrecipient user accounts in the system. And that's frequently used by states that do subgrants. They may establish user accounts as well as update lost, forgotten passwords for subrecipients. The SLAA project data entry user allows someone to add, view, or edit all projects, but they cannot validate, certify, or change state goals. So the role of LS, um, LA, a project data entry is something that you might have one of your project directors at the state library get that status. Use the menu to navigate to go to the account management subrecipient access, click add user and enter the contact information. Email address will be used to log in. Enter and confirm the password. You can select assign subrecipient an affiliated institution and select save the user. So you can enter subrecipients. One thing that you should realize about the SPR system is nobody is ever really deleted from the SPR system. Instead, should somebody leave the state library um, or move on and not be involved with this, then you can change their user status to inactive, or you can ask one of your program officers to do so. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. Thank you, Michelle. I am here to talk about timelines and deadlines and calendars. So um, each grant award, as you may already know, covers a 24 month period of performance, but we tend to award the grants um, on about a 12 month basis. So there's always some overlap with um, the awards. And the you'll see, this is the one, one first of many uh, visual timelines that you'll see us share with you all um, throughout the length of the conference. Um, we enjoy them because we find that they are very, um, they provide helpful anchors. Um, and so this is, um, a visual example of a normal uh, LSTA grant cycle timetable. So for those of you who have started in this role, whether um, at the State Library in general or as an LSTA coordinator, if you started within the past year, this may not look familiar to you because there's a lot of new and exciting things that have been happening with um, more awards than usual. But um, when we don't have uh, additional stimulus funds and rescue funds to manage, typically um, you're managing um, two awards at a time and there's um, overlap as you can see in this example. Um, and so <clears throat> in this example, the FY 2020 award starts October 1st, 2019 and it ends um, September 30th, 2021. And we've had some years where there was a continuing resolution for federal funding 
And as a result, we sent out um, the award notifications after January. So it's not exactly like neatly right at the beginning of the federal fiscal year. Sometimes there are other elements that uh, cause a bit of delay with the award notifications. Um, but a best practice that we recommend in general for working with multiple funds at once is to finish off the funds from your previous award uh, before you start drawing down on the more recent one. And so again, this is under the auspices of having only two at a time, uh, but that's our general best practice for um, working with the 24 month period of performance. This is a snapshot of one of our grant cycle calendars. This is the one for uh, 2021. Um, the PowerPoint, which is linked on the um, agenda link that we sent out previously, um, that has a link to the grant cycle calendar and we update it annually. Um, and we found that it is helpful to print out because um, it's very printer friendly and it kind of gives you a quick overview of um, due dates for materials that you need to send to us. And so this, what's nice about this is that um, it's also shaded to kind of help give you a visual idea of what award period we're talking about too. So we try, uh, there was a lot overlapping, but, um, but that's kind of the, the goal of what we're doing here. And what's nice is that it also includes like report deadlines, but also period of performance uh, deadlines as well. And it also has the quarterly grant accrual report deadlines, which tend to be quite sneaky that not everybody is immediately aware of. And so um, a quarterly grant accrual report is um, a way for us to uh, ask you all for just a brief snapshot of how things are going with, um, with the spending down of your various awards. And so it's not a formal report. Uh, that like has OMB approval and it's standardized, it's not a standard form or anything like that, which is why um, you won't see it kind of in reach as a formal uh, official report. It's, it's um, less formal than that. And so what we have here is, and there's, again, there's quarterly grant accrual report guidance on the uh, grants to states manual. And in that guidance document is an example of this very, very brief and very simple, um, table. And so what we're trying, what we're asking for you uh, all from you is um, to give us the total expenses incurred as of the end of the quarter for each of the grant awards. Um, and then compare that with the total amount um, of draws that you've made in reach. And then the final column is column B less column C. So we can understand kind of how much you've accrued um, locally. And so we have a better snapshot of how things are going. Um, you know, I feel like this, this report um, sort of unnecessarily trips people up sometimes because it's a lot simpler than I think people realize, uh, especially, you know, if you are, if you are like many states and are taking our guidance to uh, spend, you know, the majority of your funds first with your earliest award and then your recent later, sometimes that that second row, that would be your grant award for your most recent, sometimes it's a bunch of zeros. But even those bunch of zeros is part of the quarterly grant accrual report. So it's, um, and there isn't a formal way of submitting it other than providing the figures that the table is asking you for and then emailing them to that email that's on the slide. Um, so again, it's it's something that is a, a due quarterly and, um, and we ask that you submit this information no later than four business days after the last day of the quarter, because it's very um, time sensitive information that our grants admin office uses for their records. Um, and like I said, at the end of each quarter, you send an email to the address on the PowerPoint slide with the grant numbers and the total grant accrual amounts, then you'll be good to go. And finally, uh, we want to point you all to a very helpful resource for the LSTA coordinators, and that's the LSTAC listserv. Um, it's designed by and for LSTA coordinators to share information on practical aspects of administering the LSTA grants. Um, the listserv is generously maintained by the Oregon State Library, and so we are very appreciative of them um, facilitating this uh, dialogue space for everybody. 
and coordinators can ask questions about reports and sub awards. Um, that's probably going to be an increasingly hot topic. Uh, allowable costs, um, they kind of, the sky's the limit with a lot of the topics. Um, but larger questions of availability of federal funds or other policy questions would be more appropriately directed um, to us, your program officer, if they're very um, specific questions in that vein. Um, and as a disclaimer, uh, we are not the hosts of the listserv and therefore we're not responsible for the content of the listserv itself. So um, with that, we would like to uh, spend the rest of our time opening up for any questions that any of you all may have. It looks like we already have two questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Chris in Connecticut. Um, do subawardees for ARPA funds need to have need to be in SAM.gov or do they just need to have a DUNS number? I guess I can take a stab at this. Uh, this is a topic that will be covered in Cam Trowbridge's 2 CFR 200 presentation tomorrow. Our, it's, it's complicated. Our understanding of this, and this is not specific to ARPA. This is an umbrella sort of catch-all for all your grant awards. Um, sub recipients should get a DUNS at this time. That is the cleanest way of sort of accommodating them. You don't have to go through SAM.gov at the moment in order to get them a DUNS. You can go straight to the DMB site. The tricky part of this is that we're in a migration timeline that Laura touched on at the outset. So in order to move from the DUNS to the UE, um, that is going to be accommodated through SAM.gov. And only entities that are in SAM.gov will eventually get assigned the UE or have to go in later to get one. So what we're probably going to recommend for the near term is, you know, if you're given spring summer awards, get them DUNS numbers and think about, you know, sort of easing them into SAM.gov as you have time in the fall. Program officers, correct me if I'm wrong on this. And then by next spring, April of 2022, when the changeover officially happens to the UE, the subrecipients that are in the SAM.gov system will kind of automatically be, you know, brought into the fold. So there's a lot there. Um, Thank you. We have a second one. Uh, will one of the grant cycle calendars be created to layer in CARES Act and ARPA? We have not been in the habit of updating. Once a grant award calendar is made for the year, it's made at the time of award. Uh, we have not updated it. Now, this happened last year with fiscal 2020, and then CARES Act were issued. So what we were saying is CARES Act is running in parallel to your fiscal year 2020 award, and you should follow the deadlines related to your allotment grant as you would for CARES Act. We're gonna say the same thing again this year because the same thing happened. Uh, when we created the fiscal 21 calendar, we did make a note at the top, and I think this was like in a minuscule print on Dennis's slide. Um, there is you know, any references to fiscal 20 in the fiscal 2021 calendar encompass CARES Act. And so when we make our next fiscal year um, 2022 calendar, they're, they're right up there in the teeny tiny font at the very top is where that reference is. We'll do the same thing next year uh, for ARPA. But for the meantime, just know that ARPA is running in parallel or will because we haven't made the awards yet, will run in parallel to your fiscal year 2021 allotment grant. So any uh, references in the calendar to fiscal year 2021 will apply also to ARPA. Thank you. Another question, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, when and how often do we need to do FAFADA reporting? Anybody have this one on the tip of their tongue? I welcome other voices. I'll, I'll note that oh. FAFADA reporting uh, is required for any subawards that are made at $30,000 and higher. 
That's a very recent change. It used to be $25,000 and higher. Um, you only need to do the reporting in FAFATA within 30 days of you issuing the award. And you don't have to do anything additional um, after that. So one time FAFATA reporting within 30 days of an award that's over 30 grand. Yeah, um, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up because it's for reporting, it's a little bit of a reverse schedule than I think most people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. They're usually once the awards are done and once everything's been spent is when we report, but for FAFATA, it's just as soon as you award the funds. And we've had questions before of, well, what if my recipient ends up not spending as much as we were awarded? And that doesn't matter. Um, it's how much you awarded them to begin with. And it is all about transparency. People about getting the information out there right away. Where is the money going? If it's 30,000 or more, who got it? And uh, the public would have access to that. I'm hoping you all feel a little bit more comfortable since we've done the orientation. There was a lot to take in. Well, very good. And of course, if there are questions that you have um, once the session is over, feel free to reach out to your program officer. Again, our program officers are Dennis Nangle, Madison Bowles, and Michelle Farrell. Hopefully you know who your program officer is, but if you don't, just email any one of us and we will tell you. Um, there is a question of from Lori in New Hampshire, are any of us participating in the COSLA webinar Thursday about subgrants? Um, I have not been, I, I have been vaguely in touch with Tim Carabini about the possibility of us participating in webinars. I don't have one calendared for this Thursday. So that is a to be determined. Oh, here's an additional question on Fafada. If a subawardee receives multiple awards at total over $30,000 or over, a Fafada report is needed. That is a nuance I might have to look into. I yeah, I, the, my gut ahead. is that it's, it's not a requirement, but we could double check on that because it's a total, I think it is uh, for one, one specific award. Hmm. It's the counting of the award. So it's sort of an interesting kind of question. Hmm. Yeah, I get I get single audit threshold rules mixed up with this sometimes where it's like hmm. single audit threshold is the total amount of any federal awards mm -hmm. given to any any particular recipient. But but yeah we can follow up with that to be sure. It's a good question. It is. Well, it seems our questions may be tapering off and that's okay. We just wanted to give you a kind of primer on the acronyms that we tend to throw around in the federal government so that when you come into the conference tomorrow, you're not um, completely confused. And, and then just to you know welcome you and to say that this is a federal and state partnership and we are very, eager to walk alongside you as you carry out this program so that we can head off any problems at the outset. Um, you, there are no stupid questions. Please come to us with anything on your mind. 
always, and, um, and we will do our best to help you through it. We know there's a lot coming at you right now from the federal government in particular, and, um, and we, <laughs> we, we will help you along as best we can. So thank you to all of you, and we will plan to see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, our conference starts two hours earlier, and um, it will run for four hours total. It has a different URL, so please don't try to use this one again. <laughs> um, but we will, we will see you there. Thanks, everybody.